In early June 1962, Ivo visited various industrial railways in and around the Midlands. On these visits, which Ivo referred to as his industrial expeditions, he was accompanied by two fellow photographers, Norman Lockett and Alan Newman. The expeditions were pre-planned, and as a matter of policy and good manners, Ivo always sought prior permission to visit and film these intriguing and little-known railway systems. The railways visited are shown on this map, and the first location is Nichelle's electricity generating station in Birmingham, which had a Robert Stevenson and Hawthorne's 060 tank built in 1949, carrying the number three. Sharing the duties was a small Peckett 040 saddle tank, number two, and built in 1917. The power station was, of course, coal-fired. Still in Birmingham, Windsor Street Gas Works. Among the stud of locomotives here were Andrew Barclay, number two on the left, built in 1938, and Peckett, number one of 1932, which is seen outside the locomotive shed. Coming into view is another Peckett, number three, which was named Greenhive and built in 1944. Now we're about to see what Ivo called the main show of the day. The Peckett Greenhithe coming out with wagons round a severe curve and up a very steep incline. And it had to be charged. Littleton was one of the NCB collieries where locomotives were kept in spotless condition. This is Hollybank No. 3, a Hunslet 060 saddle tank built in 1936. Littleton Colliery near Penkridge is about five miles south of Stafford. Hollybank No. 3 has some trouble keeping her feet as she hauls out a rake of wagons. Next is a Manning Wardle built in 1922, here named Littleton No. 5, which is coupled to an old Great Western towed brake van. Following is a train of empties setting off from the exchange sidings with BR to climb up to the colliery. It was quite a long run. Number 6 was an austerity built by Robert Stevenson and Hawthorne in 1945. Crossing over a minor road, the train passes Ivo's well-known trademark, his Bentley. 
The journey to the colliery was all uphill, so perhaps it was fortuitous that empties were pulled uphill and loaded trains ran down the hill. As mentioned earlier, the locomotives at Littleton were invariably well-groomed and the variety of motive power were to Ivo the attractions of these industrial expeditions. This scene epitomizes it and features Robert Nelson number four. There were two or three of these Hunslets normally based at Littleton. Note that the saddle tank didn't extend over the smoke box. This was the Hunslet design which really preceded their better known austerity design. All workings to and from the colliery required brake vans, ex-Great Western vehicles. Another charming scene. It's difficult to believe this is an industrial line. Ivo, of course, loved to film the railway in the countryside. The number of wooden-bodied coal trucks still in use in 1962 is particularly noticeable. Robert Nelson No. 4 is seen again climbing towards the colliery and passing under a bridge carrying a minor road over the line. Ivo liked this particular location. And now for a very different backcloth. This is the end of the run, climbing up into the colliery yard. A final view two of the Hunslets side by side on shed at Littleton Colliery. Robert Nelson number no. four lives on, having been preserved firstly on the Great Central and latterly the Gloucester and Warwickshire railways. We now move to Coppice Colliery in the Cannock Chase area of the NCB's Midlands Division. The Colliery System's locomotive fleet included this rather attractive Kitson 060 side tank. Sadly, on this visit, she was out of use but we'll see her in steam in a later issue of the Ivo Peters collection. Here, Norman Lockett and Alan Newman are joined by another of Ivo's great friends, the Reverend Teddy Boston. The Kitson, number two in the Coppice Colliery fleet, was built at Leeds in 1921. This is an elderly Peckett, built in 1894, bearing the number three and the name Hanbury. Having brought up some empties for BR, Hanbury pulls up to enable the fireman to reset the points. Note the wagons with their side door still open. Finally, we see the Peckett chanting the colliery yard. Note in the background the variety of buses and coaches. Then they were in everyday use. Today, they're a vintage collection. Walsall Wood is the next stop on our Midlands Collieries tour. Another Kitson locomotive, 
This one was built in 1915 and named Lord Kitchener. He had, in fact, been put away at the end of the day's work. But at Ivo's request, the driver brought the engine out to be filmed before popping it back into the shed again. It was touch and go. There was only just enough steam to make it back. Again, an attractive locomotive, kept in marvellous condition, reflecting the personal pride bestowed upon these industrial engines. Caddick Wood Colliery, and probably what really caught Ivor's attention here, was this superb slot of signal, with one post serving two signal arms controlling access over a level crossing on the line from the VR exchange sidings. At the exchange sidings, we see number three, Progress, another packet dating from 1899. By complete contrast, this standard austerity number no. 7 Wimblebury was barely six years old when filmed by Ivo. Passing that intriguing old signal, Wimblebury passes over the level crossing on the way up to the colliery. This is running down towards the exchange sidings with BR with Cannock Chase in the background. Wimblebury coasts downhill with a train of loaded trucks. Now for the staff train, known as the Paddy, with the Peckett again, the single coach conveying staff at the end of the day shift. Away from the driver. Next is Grove Colliery, again in the Cannock Chase area. The engine is a Peckett, built in 1895, and you'll note that she has salter valves on the dome. Here's Ivo's famous Bentley again. His friend of many years, Mike Arlett, asked me to point out that despite popular belief, the colour was not black, but midnight blue. It's just that the car always shone so much, it appears to be black. On this visit, Teddy Boston is at the regulator. As I've always said, Teddy seemed to be able to get drives anywhere and everywhere. And, as we shall see later, this is not the only form of steam traction which Teddy was experienced in driving. The crew of the Peckett appear to have done their best at matching Ivo's efforts to polish their respective steeds. We now leave the colliery lines and transfer our attention to the Bilston Steelworks of Stewart's and Lloyd's. SNL 
had a most interesting collection of locomotives. Not, however, kept in such pristine condition as some of the earlier lines visited. Here we see Victor, the yellow engine, propelling Prince with Norman Lockett and Alan Newman enjoying a footplate ride. Are you coming up, Ivor? Victor, an Andrew Barclay 040 saddle tank, was built in 1914. This is an interesting engine, Corby, built by Kerr Stewart in 1918, but now looking somewhat down at heel. It's a case of all aboard Andrew Barclay Prince, also dating from 1918. The loco foreman leads the way, followed by the official guide, then Alan Newman and Norman Lockett, about to enjoy another footplate ride. As Ivo confirmed, these visits were tremendous fun for us all, especially when the weather was as good as on this occasion. With Prince loosely coupled to Corby, it was a case of whoops, and off we go, with Norman looking a little apprehensive. No apologies for this, the annual visit to which Ivo always looked forward, Bass at Burton-on-Trent. A marvellous railway where Ivo and his friends were assured of the warmest of welcomes, where the locomotives were always to be seen in immaculate condition, and where the bar was always open at the end of the day. Number 11, one of the delightful little 040 saddle tanks built by Nielsen Reed in 1899, sets back past a Ford 100E and a more elderly E93A. The bus railway had running rights over various lengths of BR, as seen here. On the left is Mr. Hayward, the traffic manager, with Mr. Bacon, the locomotive foreman. Another of the bus engines, number four, built by the North British Locomotive Company in 1913, doing a spot of shunting in the early evening. Bass shared their system with their associate company, Worthington. The Worthington engines, like number 16, seen here, a Bagnall dating from 1923, were painted in a dark blue livery, which contrasted with the Bass engines and their livery of turkey red, as featured here again with number 10, a Nielsen Reed saddle tank built in 1899. And so to bed. At the end of the day, the fire is thrown out, and no doubt the driver went off to a well-earned pint or two of bath. Certainly, the members of the Bath Railway Society did. And now, as they say, for something completely different. Ivo and friends pay a visit to Cadbury Rectory, the home of Teddy Boston. The primary reason was to see this a two-foot gauge ex-ironstone locomotive named Pixie. 
So here we have Teddy, Norman Lockett and Alan Newman, who by this time were becoming quite adept at playing to the camera. Teddy had purchased Pixie and was planning to lay a track around the rectory grounds. But what really amused Ivo was this, a regular Saturday morning event, the shopping trip. Ivo loved this touch. I love the RAC badge. There is a story that on one occasion it fell off and was run over and then was two feet long. Teddy oiling up and preparing to light the fire. Luckily, Norman Lockett had a box of matches handy. Teddy was taking his housekeeper, poor old girl, I was said, to Market Boswell to collect the weekend shopping. <laughs> With the fire now well away, pressure is rising fast, aided by some choice lumps of coal. The machine was built as number 5163 by Abling Porter. Nearly there, pressure reaches 75 pounds. Now it's time for the off, and the rectory gates are opened, of which more anon. A sharp turn right, and it's full steam ahead for Market Bosworth, with Ivo following at a sedate place in the Bentley. Very unusual. The local Coleman was no doubt quite used to the comings and goings of Teddy's steed and doesn't give it a second look. Perhaps it's as well that in the swinging 60s the roads were somewhat less used than today. The shopping's complete so we back out to start the journey home with Teddy's assistant hard at work on the steering wheel. Ivo's Bentley is wisely given a wide berth, with a lookout posted. A very sensible precaution on the narrow roads to Cadeby Rectory. With yet more energetic swinging of the wheel, we have a cautious final approach. But it wasn't ever thus, as Ivor recalled. This film taken in 1962, the rectory gates were still there. I feel they've long since been demolished. Two people misjudging the turn in.
marks the end of another successful shopping trip. So the fire's thrown out, and we have a final view of the very happy Teddy and his young helper. Now we go back to the type of motive power more often filmed by Ivo, starting at St. Philip's Marsh Motive Power Depot. On the 8th of November 1962, Ivo visited the shed to film this, the very last surviving member of Churchward's saddle tanks, a Great Western Class 1361 docks tank dating from 1910. She was allocated to Bristol, but in fact, there wasn't much to occupy her there. The shed master in 1962 was Don Grono, a great friend of Harold Morris, his opposite number at Bath Green Park. The engine, number 1365, was being run to and fro for the benefit of Harold Morris and Ivo, who'd been invited over to Bristol by Dan Grono. Dan asked Harold, would you like to have her over at Bath? And for one marvellous moment, Ivo thought Harold was going to say yes. But unfortunately, he said, well, no. I'm afraid we couldn't find any use for her. Ivo had envisaged filming 1365 working perhaps the evening local service from Green Park to Vinegar and back. Ivo would say, this was quite amusing. The crew stopped the engine and he'd asked, can I film you taking water? Well, no, because we've already filled her up, but how about if we go through the motions of taking water for you? So the bag was put in and Ivo signaled the driver to pretend to turn on the water. Ivo recalled how the driver mistook him, thinking he'd asked him, can you walk round the engine? Whereupon, instead of turning on the water, the driver set off for a circuit round his locomotive. Coming into camera is Harold Morris, whom of course we've met before, a good friend of Ivo. Ivo described him as a great railway enthusiast and a very fine engineman. Moving east, we come to Sydney Gardens in Bath and a rare double. Ivo is seen photographing Bully Pacific number 34046 Broughton. It was running a special from Poole to Cardiff. And he's seen again as it's leaving Twerton Tunnel west of Bath. These two sequences were filmed by one of his nephews on the 12th of August 1962. It's ten days later, and another excursion, this time featuring Ivo's favourite line. S&D Class 7F, number 53808, now of course restored by the S&D Railway Trust and running on the West Somerset Railway. The scene crossing the Great Western West of England main line just north of Cole. And later, passing over Marsbury Summit, Ivo's favourite line-side location, although perhaps he preferred the sunnier days. This is a shot which Ivo considered really dated his film. This was a very rare occurrence. A Great Western Hall, number 4992, Crosby Hall, sets off from Green Park and look, Ivo and Norman Lockett are the only two people photographing the scene. The special was returning to London and number 53808, which was seen earlier, has been on the turntable before being put away in the S&D shed.
one of the most popular of all railway venues, and the bas reliefs on the wall of the office block featuring broad gauge engines tell us we're at Swindon Works. Ivo couldn't resist taking a series of pictures of engines in immaculate condition, having just come out of a shop after general overhaul. A hall, number 6947, Helmingham Hall. A Grange, number 6874, Horton Grange. And 7229 Clun Castle, fitted with a double chimney, long before she was to become a preservation candidate. And now for a very rare visitor, a Southern Railway Lord Nelson, heading an enthusiast special to the works at Swindon. She sat back on the down road and then ran forward into the works yard. This must have been one of the very few visits to Swindon by this class of locomotive, and all the more interesting because it's Lord Nelson himself, or is it herself? And look, Amongst the ranks of Great Western engines, one of the new generation, a brand new North British Hydraulic Type II, later class 29. Norman Lockett is accompanied on this occasion by another long-standing friend of Ivo's and another superb photographer, Dick Riley. The special had been organized by the Home Counties Railway Club, many of whose members can be seen here darting around and photographing number 30850 from every angle, whilst the locomotive is turned. I think Ivo was expecting the Great Western Penny Attack to flash past. Having been watered, Lord Nelson is prepared, ready for the return trip. Another special, this one organised by the Stevenson Locomotive Society, pulls in behind that most famous of great western locomotives, the identity of which is, at once, given away by the bell, King George V. Air number 6000 is setting off to run down to Swindon Motive Power Depot for servicing and turning. King George V was, of course, at this date, still in traffic with BR prior to preservation days. Another well-known railway photographer, Kenneth Leach, decided that before photographing number 6000, he would prefer to see the reporting number removed. The crew duly obliged, the reporting number being dispatched unceremoniously to the ground. All present then lined up to photograph the locomotive. This is an interesting visitor, an Eastern Region B1, number 61039 Steenbock, on a Sunday working from Woodford Pulse on the Great Central to Swindon and back.
Note the Hymac in the background and the rail car used for services from Kemble to Sirencester and Tetbury. B1, having been turned and service, sets off to collect the return working to Woodford Halsey, followed by King George V, with time to get one final photograph. Coley Junction on the Midland Main Line from Bristol to Birmingham was the junction for a short branch line to Dursley. The gentleman on the right is another of Ivo's old friends, Arthur Rowett, the station foreman at Bath Green Park. Arthur, about to retire, happened to mention to Ivo that he'd commenced his railway career at Coley Junction back in 1917. Typically, Ivo immediately offered to run his friend up to Coley Junction for a reunion. So, as Ivo put it, we nipped up just to see the local train which in 1962 was being worked by this Ivert 260, number 46526, seen here running round at Coley and preparing for the next trip along the branch to Dursley. This was something of a contrast to Ivo's record of the previous year, seen in volume seven. Arthur's here enjoying a chat with the crew and watching the train pull away from the branch line platform with a final wave from the driver. The railways of Yeovil always seemed extremely complicated. Basically, they consisted of the North to South Great Western Line from Castle Kerry to Weymouth, with a branch via Yeovil Town to Ilminster and Taunton, and the Southern's East to West Line from Salisbury to Exeter, also with a branch to Yeovil Town. Ivo visited Yeovil Town with Norman Lockett on the 5th of August 1962. From this field, you got a marvellous panoramic view of Yeovil Town Station and the Southern's Motive Power Depot, which by this date housed both XSR and GWR locomotives. Great Western Pannier Tank, number 8745, hurls a bullied Battle of Britain class Pacific onto the shed, which was home to the M7 tanks, which operated the shuttle service of passenger trains between Yeovil Town and Pell Mill, and between the town and junction stations. On the right is a class S15, number 30846. M7 number 30129 was a regular performer on the shuttle services and is seen here drawing forward with empty stock after arrival from the Oval Junction. Note the mixture of Great Western and Southern signals. A reminder that Yeovil Town was originally a joint station, which at one period boasted no less than four signal boxes. Number 30129 now sets back into the station for a trip to Penn Millenbach.
It's hoped that the sight of a Drummond M7 on push-pull duties will soon be recreated with the return to working order of number 30053 on the Swanage Railway. Yet another picture for Norman Lockett's collection, as the same Great Western Pannier tank, number 8745, is standing in briefly whilst the M7 is serviced at lunchtime. Here she is setting off the run round to the junction on the southern main line from Waterloo to Exeter. This is the M7 returning from the junction, a two mile run. Later in the afternoon, she's seen approaching Yeovil Town. Now we move over to the single line linking Penn Mill to the town station. Ivor had started the camera thinking the M7 would appear, but was caught out by this N-class mogul, number 31810. The M7 followed. This picturesque setting, with the trees lining both sides of the railway, appealed very much to Ivor. Number 30129, returning from Penn Mill, waits for the board to come off. There it goes, and the train pulls into Yeovil Town Station. The final scene at Yeovil sees Norman Lockett chatting with the fireman about his engine. Ivo never discovered who the small boy was. He must be in his early 40s by now. Does anyone out there recognize himself? We now move westwards to Sidmouth Junction, where, on the 2nd of September 1962, two M7s, number 30025 and 30024, were waiting to take over an enthusiast special for a run to Exeter via Tipton and Exmouth. Both locos were beautifully turned out and were filmed and photographed from all angles, whilst awaiting arrival of the excursion from Waterloo behind Lord Nelson, number 30861, Lord Anson. The M7s backed down past the tall signal box onto the special and then set off along the branch towards Tipton St John's, junction for the lines to Sidmouth and Exmouth. Having got ahead of the train, Ivo next filmed the special here in this deep cutting. 
climbing away from Budley Salterton towards Exmouth, where the locomotives had to run round for the next leg of the journey back to the main line at Exeter. This enabled Ivo to leapfrog ahead again, and at Lower Limpston he filmed the special running alongside the ex estuary, a line still in use today, but not unfortunately providing us with sights like this. Returning east, we visit Salisbury, and a stroke of good luck for Ivo. For, unknown to him, his visit to Salisbury Motor Power Depot coincided with that of a most unexpected engine, BT Well Tank number 30587. The locomotive, just withdrawn from traffic, was on her way from Wadebridge to Eastley, and had stopped over at Salisbury Shed for servicing. This little engine, dating from 1874, was of course destined to be saved, and as part of the national collection, can now be seen on static display at Buckfastley on the Dark Valley Railway. At this stage in the proceedings, quite a number of footplate crews had gathered round Ivo to see what was going on and who was doing the filming. Number 30587 finally came to rest outside the shed, inside which Ivo had noticed a BR Class 9. He just happened to mention what a marvellous picture it would make if the two locomotives were to be seen side by side. As Ivo had hoped, one of the drivers immediately offered to bring out the 9F. And here they are. A picture which Ivo naturally christened David and Goliath. For our final 1962 scenes, we return to the Somerset of Dorset a very sad day. Saturday, the 8th of September, 1962, was the final day on which the Pines Express and all other through expresses ran via the s and line. It was to prove the death knell of the s and For the final runs, the last steam locomotive built by BR, number 92220, Evening Star, had been transferred to Bath Green Park. Here she is on the last run with driver Peter Guy and fireman Ronald Hyde climbing past Moorwood and crossing Portway Bridge towards Vinegar. This shot was, in fact, filmed by one of Ivo's nephews. Ivo was at the line site taking a still photograph. At Evercreech Junction, a pine wreath was placed on the smoke box door of Evening Star. Our final scene shows the last pines approaching Coal Station. <laughs> 